I'm Keith Gosland. I'm Linda Quinlan. And I'm Ann Charles. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. It's July 22nd, 2024. Um, we are taping in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize is as unceded indigenous land. So we have a lot to talk about. Let's start with Keith. Oh, yeah. Uh, trivia. And, and then there's some things that we'll talk about at dinner that we're not. So this week's trivia question, and, and I had my hopes on Linda. <laughs> the, the Olympics are starting very soon. This was the first openly LGBTQ <coughs> plus athlete to compete as an out athlete. When might that have been? And what might the event have been? Mm. So looking at the events and, and things you can do with your time, Rainbow Umbrella, the women's discussion group. Yes. Book discussion group. Yes. The book you're reading is uh, Hijab Butch Blues. It's fabulous. By Lamia H. It's Wonderful. It's one of the best books I've read in a long time. Ah, very good. Okay, and we've been plugging this for a while, and we're going to sort of narrow it down a bit. The Queer Arts Festival, Saturday, August 17th, Plainfield Rec Field. And anybody who has followed the news knows that Plainfield was decimated by the flooding. Yep. So I've been in touch with the people organizing the festival, they think it's still on because the town thinks they will get the temporary bridge back in place so you can get to the rec field and the rec field will be in a condition to host it. But be watching Facebook and their Instagram and we will report on the next show if this is a go. Okay. So, and please look on their Facebook page because they said there are several of the artisans who would be exhibiting who are directly impacted by the flooding, who have GoFundMe and sort of what can you do to help support us. Lost Nation Theater, Time to Dance is such an understatement. They are doing the prom mm -hmm. that I attended yesterday afternoon. They were as good, if not better, than most touring companies I've seen coming through Vermont. Mm. This is my strongest praise for them. The actors not only knew their lines, they knew their characters. And they lived them out in front of you. <laughs> strong singing voices, strong acting. They nailed it. Good. And they will be performing Weekends. Was it full? Through, it was pretty full. Weekends through the matinee on Sunday, August 4th. So if you're watching this on Saturday night, you could still go to the matinee tomorrow at 2. Okay. And it's worth it. The Pride Center, a plug out again, that their health and wellness survey is up online. It takes approximately 15 minutes. And they really do look at the results to inform the programs that they are running. And... The survey will be open until September 15th. And what I missed the last time was the Pride Center Safe Space Anti-Violence Program. They are doing affinity groups. If you're a survivor of intimate partner violence, it's a six-week series. You come together as a group. It's facilitated. They talk about the issues. They talk about what you're experiencing and resources. But as soon as this six series completes with the intimate partner violence, they're gonna do a similar one starting with sexual violence. So please go on their website, look at them as a resource. Eva is their new program director. They are incredibly enthusiastic about the work they're doing and are really trying to outreach to ensure that Safe Space is offering the programs that our communities need. What's Eva's so, last name? West. Oh, I, from so out in the 802. Bingo. Yes. I, we ran into each other at Montpelier Pride, and we sort of looked at each other like, I know you, but we'd only met on Zoom. <laughs> it's Westheimer, I think. Westheimer, yeah. Um, along the book discussion group, Fletcher Flea, duh, 
Fletcher Free Library in Burlington, I'm not going to try it three times real fast. Mm -hmm. They're doing their Queer Reads Book Club. Mm. It is the final Saturday of each month. And in August, it will be Light from Uncommon Stars, Rika Aoki. Mm. And then in September is Everyone on the Moon is Essential Personnel by Julian Jarbo. Ah, interesting. So, and they put Very them out in advance so that you can look at them. Rainbow Bridge in Barrie. Please go on their website, look at their events sections. They are listening to what the community says they want. They're coming up with events. They're doing a board games night. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought it's like when Rainbow Umbrella was going bowling. It's, yes. They're just completing, and it will have been completed by the time this show airs, a five-day camping trip to Kettle Pond, mm -hmm. where you could either go for the day, hang out with the Central Vermont Queers, you could go overnight camping. There were lean-tos. There were tents. There were varying camping options and experiences. Well, I hope people enjoy that. <laughs> I, apparently, not all of us will be attending, but, but definitely look on their website. Yeah. And they do have a new executive director who someone might be talking with recently. That's right. And with that... Oh, it's me. I'm Yes. Up. Well, as, as, as we know, uh, Joe Biden <laughs> has dropped out of the race. Pete Buttigieg. No one No. No. <laughs> no. Um, anyway, um, so I guess she'll probably be picking a vice president soon. But anyway, she is very, she is our ally. Um, Kamala so, Harris we're talking about. Yes. Well, it wouldn't be Pete Buttigieg because he's gay. <laughs> right? Well, moving, moving on. I don't think you said her name. You said he dropped out, and then. Oh yeah. Well, anyway. So I just did want to say that 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 was good news. It gave me hope for the first time in years. Um, so we're going to start with Nashville, Tennessee, if people don't mind. Although Bashar isn't he from Tennessee? Bashar might be on the list as vice president. Kentucky, I think Bashir. Yeah, is that Kentucky? I yeah. think okay. I'm thinking you're right. All right. So anyway, in Nashville, Tennessee, HIV positive people who were convicted in Tennessee of sex work under a decades old aggravated prostitution law will no longer be required to face a lifetime registration as a violent sex offender. Under the lawsuit settlement finalized this week, last year LGBTQ plus states aggravated prostitution statute, arguing that the law was enacted in response to the AIDS scare and discriminated against HIV positive people. That challenge was settled this week when Governor Bill Lee and others signed off on the agreement. So that's good news, right? And now we come back to, you know, the same old struggles over and over again, but in San Francisco. Lawyers for a Christian homeless shelter were in federal appeals court to challenge a Washington state anti-discrimination law that would require um, the charity to hire LGBTQ plus people and others who do not share its religious beliefs, including those on sexuality and marriage. Union Gospel Mission, Mission in Yakima, about 150 miles southwest of Seattle, uh, Oh, this was on the San, this was in the San Francisco newspaper. Anyway, so this is Washington State. Sorry, the Alliance Defending Freedom, a global legal organization, is assisting the mission. Washington's law against discrimination in, prohibits employees with at least eight employees um, from uh, this um, non-discrimination law. So. Uh, the state Supreme Court, court ruled in 2021 that the exemption should only apply to ministerial, ministerial positions. Yakima's human, human gospel mission hires only co-religiousists to advance its religious pur pur purpose and expects employees to abstain from sexual immorality, including adultery, non-married cohabitation, cohabitation 
and homosexual conduct, according to court documents. I, I'm tongue-tied. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know. <laughs> Andy Bashir is from Kentucky, the okay. governor. Good. All right. Let's see if I can go on without. <laughs> Please continue. GOP Senator J.D. Vance blocked more than two dozen Biden ambassador nominees for months by grilling them on their approach to LGBT and DEI agendas, according to a leaked memo. A singer-songwriter who worked with Donald Trump on his hit show, The Apprentice, revealed that the former president openly opposed the LGBT community. She further questioned his leadership skills, adding that the 78-year-old is not a good boss. Her statements came days after Trump was declared as a Republican nominee for 2024 election at the RNC. Ohio Senator J.D. Vance is, running, is his running mate. Cindy Lauper joined Christine Amapour on CNN to openly discuss her time working under Trump on The Apprentice during the show's ninth season in 2010. The singer said that the former president is not a good boy, boss and didn't stay loyal to his employees. So, what a surprise. No surprise there. Yeah. Brittany Griner, the gold medal winning Phoenix Mercury Center, and her wife, Cheryl Lee, welcomed a son in early July. And here's a picture of them. The basketball star, who is heading to the 2004 Paris Olympics this month, told CBS News that the couple were celebrating everything that's happened this year. So, and here's a picture. And um, in a disheartening move that echoes Tractor Supply Company's recent actions on stepping away from Pride events, John Deere, the iconic farm equipment maker, has abandoned its diversity, equality, and inclusion initiatives effectively turning its back on its black LBGTQ and women employees and customers. The Tuesday announcement states that the company will no longer support cultural awareness events and will audit its training materials to ensure that they are free of socially motivated messages. <coughs> So don't go buy your John Deere tractor. From, from Tractor Supply. <laughs> yeah. It's right down there on the very Montpelier Road. All right. And um, the Chino Valley Unified School District and some parents have sued the state of California over new law banning the forced outing of LGBTQ students. Governor Gavin Newsom signed Assembly Bill 1955 into law Monday. It bars school districts from requiring teachers and other staffers to disclose a student's sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression to their parents or guardians without the student's consent. Such forced outing puts young people at risk if their families are not accepting. The law takes effect January 1st and will be the first of its kind in the nation. I like him, but I don't think we need anybody from California to be vice president. Moving no, on. No, I don't think she'll, Harris will choose him for that reason, no. among others. Tennessee's law banning drag queens from performing in public spaces has been resurrected and can stand for now. The Sixth District Court of Appeals dismissed a legal challenge to the state's controversial Adult Entertainment Act on Thursday, citing the plaintiff's lack of standing. The decision reversed a lower court's, ru lower court's ruling that had de like, declared the law unconstitutional. And I'll read one more, Anne, and then we'll move on to you. How's that sound? Good. This fall, Yem I hope I don't massacre these names, but this fall, Yemi Adelaide Ade will bring the ball to Atlanta as she headlines Global Black Pride with Broadway legend out 
and out 100 honoree Billy Porter, and fellow Nigerian singer and actress Oma Wumi, Oma Wumi, dubbed Queen of Afro Pop. El Aid will make history as the first African music artist to headline a Pride Festival in the U.S. So that's it for me, Ann. Okay, you can well, start on our international news. Let me start by thanking Susan Loyne for doing oh, yeah. a wonderful job subbing for us. She was really great. Um, and it was a pleasure watching you interact. It was, they were both really good shows. Thanks to Susan and Keith, of course. Um, speaking of Susan and theater, Lynn and I had the privilege of seeing Susan in Spamalot recently at the Valley Players Theater. And if you want to keep up with her career, she's going to be in Much Ado About Nothing yep. at the Unadilla Theater. Um, so Spamalot is closed, but Much Ado is open. I think it's maybe, it's imminent anyway. So uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I have some news from Asia um, that I'd like to start with. It starts out with the bad, bad news. I'm counting Russia as part of Asia. And I have a picture before you of the Russian-American journalist Masha Gessen. Here she is during a celebration of life for the late Irvish Vad in 2022. And unfortunately, a Russian court on July 15th convicted her, I'm sorry, convicted them. And I correct me, here they are. I knew I would screw this up, and so I have. But anyway, the Russian court convicted them in, in absentia on sham charges of false information about the war in Ukraine. Gessen, who was born in Russia, but is now based in the U.S., has called out the actions of the Russian government since February 2022 um, when they invaded Ukraine, uh, the Russian government. According to a statement Gessen posted on Facebook, the charges were driven by comments they made in a 2022 YouTube-based interview with Yuri Dud, during which Gessen dismissed the 2022 Russian atrocities in Bucha, a city outside Kiev, where Russian forces brutally killed numerous civilians as well as prisoners of war. And I happened to hear that report on Bucha. It was really chilling and such good journalism. And I'm just am really a fan of Gessen's uh, in general. Uh, so they serve as a staff opinion columnist at the New York Times. Uh, Russia, according to them, Russia issued the charges in August and placed them on a wanted list in December. Um, responding to the conviction, Gessen issued a lengthy public statement in Russian, but according to a translated version of the text, Gessen said they consider the criminal accusations to be illegal and unfounded. So that's scary news. Um, Gessen said that <coughs> this criminal prosecution amounts to a ban on journalism and an attempt to punish them for fulfilling their professional responsibilities. Um, I am outside the Russian Federation, the, so the so-called court can consider my case arrest and sentence only in absentia, they wrote. Um, and bad things are happening in Russia all around, you know. Uh, we probably heard about the two people who were involved in a play who have been imprisoned and, you know, arrested and imprisoned. Um, many people have faced trumped up charges in the midst of this crackdown on dissent, uh, an issue that's worsened over the last decade, uh, especially following the invasion of Ukraine. One of the most high profile cases is Brittany Griner's, of course, and then there's the Wall Street Journal reporter and so forth. So bad news from Russia. I'm really uh, kind of fearful for, for them. Um, but good news now for the rest of my Asia coverage. Top South Korean court hands gay couple a historic win on spouse rights. And I have a picture before you now of So Jung Wook, who's on the left, and Kim Yong Min, 
who's on the right. Uh, South Korea Supreme Court recognized new rights for same-sex couples Thursday, saying that they must provide health insurance for a gay man's partner in a landmark ruling that left activists weeping for joy. And you can see uh, Kim Jong-min kind of drying tears in the picture. This is so um, cool and the product of resistance. Um, the country's highest court ruled that it was discrimination for the state health insurers to treat same-sex couples differently from their heterosexual counterparts. And what they did was they sued um, the national health insurance um, and they were denied, they appealed, and the appeal was accepted. The verdict now cannot be appealed. It means that common law spouses of the same sex can now register as dependents on their partner's health insurance, state health insurance, something long permitted for heterosexual partners. It was brought by them uh, and they've been living together and held a wedding ceremony in 2019. They had no legal validity, but as South Korea does not recognize same-sex marriage still, in 2021 they sued um, and... But we kind of started out that way, right? I mean, you know, first it was Gay partners could have, you know, domestic partner and then domestic partnership yeah. benefits, then civil unions, then marriage yeah. equality. So yeah. after the verdict, so said today, love won again. Pivotal moment. Um, but a lawyer and an LGBTQ activist said that the ruling goes beyond just specific rights and benefits. It ultimately paves the way for the legalization of same-sex marriage in South Korea following Thailand, Thai, Taiwan and Thailand. Okay, um, more good news from the Philippines. A Philippine city on Manadu, it's named Manadu City on the island of Cebu, is the latest city in the Philippines to pass a comprehensive anti-discrimination ordinance oh. to protect its LGBTQ community. The regulations prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression in healthcare, education, public accommodations, and from impediments to free association and organizations. More than 30 cities across the island nation have passed anti-discrimination ordinances to protect the LGBTQ community. However, a bill to ban sexual orientation and gender identity and expression discrimination nation, nationwide has been stuck in the Philippine Congress for more than 20 years, having been first introduced in 2001. A lawmaker has also attempted to get a bill to recognize same-sex civil unions passed, but it is stalled in committees. So mixed news from the Philippines. Still, the ordinance is good. Now, I would like to move to the continent of Oceania <laughs> to talk to you about a New Zealand film called Mysterious Ways. Oh. This looks so interesting. And, you know, I look to see where you can see it. You can buy it or rent it on YouTube. It's coming out in August, but I'm sure it'll, you know, proliferate around theaters we and hope. other streaming um, services. Written and directed by New Zealand's Paul Ormerland, the film follows a media storm that threatens the marriage between a vicar and his Samoan boyfriend after they announce their intentions to have a traditional wedding in the church. The film also marks one of the first on-screen representations of what is known in the Samoan community as a fafafine, an integral part of Samoa's, Samoan culture, fafafine, are des assigned male identity at birth, but explicitly embody both masculine and feminine gender traits in a way unique to Polynesia. So let's look at a oh. clip from Mysterious Ways. You ready for this? When did this go up? Yesterday. Yeah. Wondered when the next crusade was kicking off. I know for a fact that the Reverend lives with another man. I didn't know you were off the market, Reverend. So who's the lucky guy? It's amazing. I'm here for the wedding. It's Jason's my amazing. uncle. I bet you've never seen someone as pretty as me before. Real girls are pretty. I don't even know what he is. You'd be surprised how many straight men like a big one. Billy! 
We have to be prepared for controversy. It's amazing. What it will hurt all of us. Just how sweet the sound. You'll become an outcast, a martyr. When what? Okay, go here. Turns out to be. Well, that'll solve everything. Drag show in a church, eh? This isn't just about you and me anymore. Was it ever? Standing on the doorstep of my thirteenth. How are you two doing? Why? Has he said something? Billy, what happened? Ned. I miss him so much. He's not into your sisters. What life did you have before us? Why take something so beautiful? How dare you? And make it ugly. You're not my savior. It's amazing. If you could screw away to self love, every gay man would be Gandhi. When what seemed impossible turns out to be. Interesting. I hope we get to see it. Oh, I know. We so, should probably move over to Keith now for All right. Okay. Very good. All right. All so. Right. We're just going to start with a brief comment that the ACLU is still pursuing the Scott administration and Health Commissioner Levine specifically looking for redacted minutes and emails where Commissioner Levine removed the committee's recommendation about alternative drug sites and using the federal settlement money to support them. He deliberately and the ACLU says illegally deleted that information, and they are asking the courts to cite them for not adhering to Vermont's open meeting law. Wow. So we will be watching. On July 14th, the Democratic Party LGBTQ plus caucus met. It was a small but very informative gathering. Some of the background that I was unaware of is the use of caucuses is new to the Vermont Democratic Party. Mm. They've only used a caucus structure for the past year. Mm. And the decision was made that they would start them as affinity groups. So if you're a member of the LGBTQ plus caucus, it's only our community that's being invited and participating nice. and making decisions. And the LGBTQ caucus has been formally recognized by the executive committee, which means there is a member from the caucus who sits on the Democratic Party executive committee. Can we write you that? With, with full voting privileges. Who is it? You know Isaac. <gasps> yeah. Of course. Evan Franz, who he and <clears throat> Michelle, nicknamed Mimi, are the two people who really put this together and have been the impetus right. behind this. <clears throat> what was interesting at the gathering, both Mike Pichek and Tom Jenner spoke. They both said their, their top priorities was housing, affordable and mixed housing, mm -hmm. both in type, income, et cetera. And they said to, to avoid some of the unnecessary conflict the focus should continue to be what our legislature did this year by lessening <coughs> Act 250 to encourage downtown development mm -hmm. so that they would be maybe larger and higher multi-unit, multi-income condos, apartments, whatever. And the rural area, we leave rural. We preserve agricultural and open land. Mm -hmm. And that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And then there was a conversation about restructuring the education formula based on. Tom made a very interesting comment. He said the office of lieutenant governor, for which he is a candidate in the Democratic primary, primary is August 13th. You can vote in advance at your town clerk or by going on the Secretary of State website. He said that office should be a messaging office, that the lieutenant governor should sit in on all the cabinet meetings and should be bringing up at those cabinet meetings the legislative priorities and the legislative directives and then holding a press conference and sharing 
this is what we're working on. This is what we have presented to the administration. This is the rationale behind it. This is how we view going forward. So it's a different vision for how that office, which most people view as being ceremonial, yeah. could indeed function. Uh, and Stuart Ledbetter, who is the Democratic candidate for and the And on our show. This is true. And we were his first out interview. So uh, the Chittenden Central Senate District. He was going around talking to people saying, why are we not talking more about the constitutional amendment? And it passed during this last session, as we reported on, that would add sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, and elevate it to the constitutional level to provide protection. So regardless of what happens in statute, it's in the Constitution. All right. Now hold that thought as we move over to New Hampshire, where late on Friday, like three days ago, Governor Sununu signed three oh. bills and vetoed one. Oh. He signed H1205, and this is the bill that had to do with transgender athletes competing on a grades 5 through 12 level. And the bill requires that all sports be designated as males, men, or boys, females, women, or girls, or co-ed, or mixed. The law prohibits students of the male sex from participating on female teams. And you know how they're defining yeah. male sex sure. yeah. at birth. The other bill that he signed was H1312. This allows parents to be notified in advance and to have their students opt out of any educational presentations or material that includes sexual orientation, gender identity, or a discussion for which they are in agreement as long as you know, they offer alternative education but alternative education is not defined. So people are predicting uh, uh -huh. this is going to be challenged in court because it was New Hampshire only two months ago that the federal court said your restriction about what teachers can include in their cur curriculum, gender identity, sexual orientation, ex sex ed, et cetera, is too vague. Therefore, it's unconstitutional. So. The other bill <clears throat> that he signed. Move on soon, Keith. Oh, the other bill <laughs> that he signed would what? bar any gender reaffirming surgery for minors. Totally off the table. So, the one bill he vetoed was where they tried to rewrite and take language out of their non discrimination statutes, which is why I'm saying a constitutional amendment mm -hmm. would be very advantageous for us very quickly. The Olympics out sports says there is 144 out athletes competing. Of those, the U.S. has 28. Brazil has 23. Mm -hmm. Canada only has six. But the event that has the most out candidates, athletes, with 34 out participants is Women's soccer, which may explain why Brazil is so high. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, on a less cheerful note, last week right, right, right wing extremists caused a charity LGBT plus book event in Alabama to be canceled uh, because of the violence that was threatened against them. Um, let's see, what do we got here? Um, I wanted to do, oh, Dr. Ruth died. I know. Oh, I know. And she was an LGBTQ advocate. That's an understatement. I know. She was really cool. I really liked her a lot. Who got the red glasses? Huh? Who what? Go on. <laughs> Go on. Josh Coleman, an LGBTQ plus li liaison, li liaison, 
from Birmingham and president of Central Alabama Pride has organized an event at Oyster City Brewing in Mobile, Mobile to celebrate his new children's book, Finding My Rainbow. The book, which details Coleman's journey of coming out and finding acceptance, was featured in Drag Queen Storytime session. Um, but now, um, Oyster City does not abide hate. We make beer for those who enjoy it over the age of 21, regardless of race, gender, or orientation. But they stopped the event because they said that they were worried about the safety of their employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is kind of interesting because over the weekend in Texas, hundreds of gay men attending the Daddy Land Circuit Party in Dallas were evicted from the Crown Plaza downtown Dallas, the host hotel at which they were staying, leading to mass confusion and accusations of homophobia. The eviction was prompted by complaints by Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority members who were also in town for their bicentennial national convention, according to the hotel owner. He said the women complained about the attire of some of the Daddy Land attendees. Security officers and hotel managers delivered the eviction notice around 4 p.m. Saturday. Occupants of 88 rooms were asked to leave, though a Daddy Land representative said the number was closer to 300. <coughs> However, the hotel has only 292 rooms according to Visit Dells. The notice was blunt and to the point. The owner of the hotel is requesting you leave immediately. You will get a refund for Saturday and Sunday. Please move by 6 p.m. All parties and events are canceled. So, bye-bye. That's sick. They should be boycotted. They should be sued for that. Yes. They really should. Maybe they will be. Um, and then I have a, uh, also Richard Simmons died. Yes. Yeah. We all remember him, or at least many of us do, from his uh, fitness Sweatin', guru. Sweating to the oldies. Yeah. And I, and I wanted to do a clip. And this is a clip, and you'll see it in a minute, is uh, about Lincoln, and it's called Lover of Men, examines the life of America's most consequential president, Abraham Lincoln. As told by preeminent Lincoln scholars and never before seen photographs and letters, the film details Lincoln's romantic relationships with men. Lover of Men widens its lens into the history of human sexual fluidity and focuses on the profound differences between sexual mores of the 19th century and those we hold today. The film fills in an important, important miss, missing pieces of American history and challenges the audience to consider why we hold such limited view of human sexuality. Lover of Men is not only an exploration of gender roles and sexual identity, but also serves as an examination of American intolerance. And don't ask me where it's playing because I don't know. It's a book. No, it's a documentary. Oh, it is? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. It's a documentary. Shut my mouth. All right. He is considered a sacred figure by both Republicans and Democrats. He led the nation through its greatest crisis. He's on our currency. We build monuments to him. He's the greatest president the United States has ever had. Today, the big question that people are asking is, was Abraham Lincoln gay? In the 19th century, for many men, their closest relationships were other men, and same for women. Men would live with another man when they're single, and often did, and shared beds. Lincoln probably slept in the same bed with men more than he did with women. One of the things that fascinates scholars is his bedding down with Joshua Speed for four years. There is love between those two men. When you put together all of the evidence, it's really startling. Lincoln has a type, dashing, daring, 
We have this notion that if you have an attraction like that, boom, that's your orientation. Sexuality through the mid-19th century was far more fluid. But for someone who wanted a political career, it was mandatory that you have a wife. Dear Speed, I shall be very lonesome without you. Yours forever, Lincoln. What you'd have in the 19th century was very strict marriage culture. Get married, and then everything is possible. Captain David Derrickson became friends with Lincoln while they were living here at the cottage. There is a soldier here devoted to the president, and when Mrs. L is not home, sleeps with him. What stuff. He was seen wearing the president's nightshirt. If you want a smoking gun, here it is. But then you see all these shifts to the end of the 19th century. Freud was devastating to sexuality, defining very rigid categories. And they're saying, if a man loves another man, it's unnatural. Homosexuality is a mental illness. It was not only wrong, it was punishable. If Lincoln were to look down today, he would see the United States at a particularly fragile moment. History is so important because it allows us to understand who we were, who we might become. Lincoln's legacy is the insistence on equality. We have been in the hustle power. If you can accept a queer Lincoln, you can accept queer people overall. He should inspire us to achieve a true democracy for everyone. Alpha Phi Alpha, the oldest historically black fraternity in the U.S., has reported, reportedly moved to ban transgender members, a decision that has caused a rift between the older members that make up the organization's national leadership and its younger general body and collegiate and alumni chapter leaders, according to GLAD. So they're not happy about that. And, and Elon Musk is leaving California to move to Texas um, because of the Safety Act signed by California Governor Gavin Newsom. Newsom. He said that was his final straw. Oh. <laughs> Because of this law and many others, they're proceeded at attacking both families and companies. SpaceX will now move its headquarters to Hawthorne, from Hawthorne, California, to Starbase, Texas, he posted. And, um, you know, there was a big to-do about, you know, sexual LGBT stuff on there and that he wasn't pleased, and so he's leaving California. Um. Lover Bye. of Men is at AMC Theaters, released September 6, 2024. Good. All mm -hmm. right. Didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So, Anne, you have about 10 minutes to well, I have a delicious story from Rome. Um, a person, he, let me show you a picture of this person uh, dressed up as the Pope in the Rome Pride, and uh, <laughs> he is holding a sign that says, there's too much queerness in this pride. <laughs> uh, this was on June 15th, the Pride Parade in Rome, Italy, on its 30th anniversary. A record number of revelers marched in the Italian capital, past historic sites, waving flags, carrying signs, protesting a range of issues from the current right-wing government stance on gender ideology to the Israel-Hamas war. The most visible and creative displays were in reference to a pejorative anti-gay word the Pope Francis repeatedly used in May at two closed-door meetings with members of his inner circle at the Vatican. And Susan reported on this, as did I. Um, he used the word fragiante, and the rough translation is faggotry. The full quotation was, there is already too much faggotry in the sem seminaries. Uh, at Rome Pride, several signs were seen uh, played and played on the word and the full comment. A number of the signs were held by attendees dressed up as the pontiff. And let's show this picture again. <laughs> huh? There's too much fragione in this pride, read one 
large sign carried by a faux Francis clad in plastic papal, papal regalia, a white cassock robe, and Suchetto skullcap, accessorized with a rainbow-colored crucifix. A more somber masquerader dressed in a black monk's tunic carried a sign displaying the word Fragaccioni. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. Written, <laughs> written in an arc over a pair of hands clasped in prayer and tangled in a multicolored rosary. Two men in white tank tops carried a giant cardboard cutout of, Pro of Pope Francis around the neck of which they wrapped a rainbow feather boa. Each man carried a sign, one saying in Italian, Franci, you are welcome in our parish. The other said you could never have too many fra Gianni, say it again. All right. Fracciani. I don't know. The root of the term is frocio, which has the same uh, original detonation as its English translation, faggot or faggot, a bungle of sticks to spark fire. Somewhere along the line, it came to be imbued with homophobia. So that's sort of an amusing story from Rome. Yeah. Uh, let's look at a picture now of a former Formula One driver, Ralph Schumacher, who comes, who has come out as gay, um, becoming the most high-profile driver in the sports history to do so. Uh, he made the announcement on Instagram showing a picture of um, his business manager, Etienne, and he watching a sunset with their arms around each other. Um, his a German actor friend, Carmen Geis, made it explicit. I want to tell you about a person who plays a very special role in my life. For many years, I have known and loved him infinitely. Today, he confessed his homosexuality. I like the verb there. Um, <laughs> this was a step in active liberation and self-acceptance well, for him. kind of goes with the one before. Of the it's Pope, a religious, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although this is Germany. Uh, the 49-year-old German's decision is significant in, the, in that it demonstrates the extent to which motorsport is becoming more accepting and diverse, something Formula One has made a concerted effort to improve in recent years. And this is sort of interesting. Since the championship began in 1950, only three other Formula One drivers have come out. Mike Butner, who rode between 71 and 73, and Lila Lombard, Lila Lombardi. Uh, and I'd like to show you a picture of hers because um, a picture of her because there's all this information about the guys, but nothing about her. You know how long how long they lived and so forth. She identified as a lesbian and was in a long-term relationship, um, and she died tragically in 1992 at the age of 50 from breast cancer. Oh. And I looked her up because none of this is in the article. Wow. Um, motor racing also now has an organization called Racing Pride, working to promote LGBTQ plus inclusivity. Uh, and it's supported uh, by organizations such as the British Automobile Racing Club. So let's go to Europe, more of Europe. Um, the UK defends the ban on puberty, puberty blockers and moves to make it permanent. You know, there was some excitement when the Labour government took over, but they're expanding the conservative stance against puberty blockers and trying to make it permanent, as I just said. Um, the day after their landslide election, uh, the West Streeting was appointed Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Um, so we don't yet know the risks of stopping pubertal hormones at this critical life stage. That is the basis upon which I'm making decisions. So uh, he's previously supported trans rights, but more recently he's walked back that support, saying that he no longer stands by the belief, by the belief that trans women are women. Mm. So that's discouraging. But the rest of the European news is kind of uplifting, starting with the Dutch Supreme Court's decision. And Susan reported on a rubus deplorable vote last time. Just now, the Dutch Supreme Court decided that civil marriage is open to same-sex couples in Curaçao and Aruba immediately. 
The Supreme Court considers it discriminatory that same-sex couples don't have the same marriage rights as other couples. Because they're the protectorate or whatever. Right, right, right. right. The Supreme Court took into consideration that politicians had been debating the issue for a long time without results. That's why it found it justifiable to open civil marriage per direct instead of asking the governments of Aruba and Curaçao to act. The British should do that. This is great news. Of the six Dutch overseas territories, overseas municipalities Bonaire, Saba, and St. Eustasis, and constituent countries Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin, all of which are in the Caribbean Sea, this only leaves St. Martin, which was not part of the court case, without marriage equality. So the Dutch yeah. government has stepped in. Good. Two bad news, two bad items from uh, Africa. Burkina Faso's military junta has um, ordained that homosexuality will be punished by the law. They overturned the country's policies two years after seizing power. Um, they've agreed on criminalizing homosexuality. It wasn't widely accepted in the nation, but it wasn't previously outlawed. So, and then there are currently 61 countries that criminalize consensual same-sex sexual acts in some form. 32 of them are in Africa, with punishments ranging from fines and imprisonment to the death penalty. Um, another bad story, there's a dark day in Malawi for the rights of LGBTQ people. A constitutional court upholds criminalization of same-sex conduct. It rejected a legal challenge to the penal code that makes same-sex conduct a criminal offense, so it will remain a criminal offense. Um, the three-member panel dismissed an application from Jan Wilkin Exter, a Dutch citizen, and Jana Gonani, a trans woman and sex worker, challenging the constitution of the penal code. These sections criminalize anyone who has carnal knowledge of any person against the order of nature, attempts to commit an unnatural offense, or undertakes indecent practices. These provisions are vague and overly broad, facilitating anti-LGBTQ discrimination and can result in sentences up to 14 years in prison. Um, both applicants face criminal prosecutions before lower courts. Exter was accused of abusing children, and Janani was charged with false pretense for presenting herself as a woman. Okay, we're gonna have to move on, Ian. Okay. Keith might have a few things that he didn't get to talk about. I, I was and say it was the trivia. Besides trivia, you might have something else you wanna. Expatiate on the Olympics? Yeah. Uh, well, no, the, the Olympics, I was just gonna talk about you know, the, the number of athletes. The other interesting thing was it was also out of New Hampshire. New Hampshire has something that's called the New Hampshire Governor's Executive Council. If that sounds bizarre, <laughs> the article says it is. This is a five-person council. It operates as a check-in on the governor by holding veto power mm. over contracts, pardons, and this is the important one, nominations, such as judicial nominations. Mm. And the reason it came up is that Emmett Sodalti, who was in the news because the religious right targeted his open business, is running for one of these seats. Mm. So there would be an openly gay man on the governor's executive council watching the judicial nominees coming through. Nice. nice. Think of the federal courts and the Supreme Court. And yeah. so the Olympics and that first out athlete. And the reason my hopes was on Linda <clears throat> was because it was 1988 and it was dressage. See, I the horses. Just, I, I'm a thoroughbred You are a racing. If you want to say that the dressage horses aren't thoroughbreds, I think they'll come out. <laughs> but it was Robert Dover, U.S. Olympic team. He competed in every Olympic on our dressage team between 1984 and 2004. 
and won four team bronze medals. He is the most highly decorated U.S. dressage equestrian. Mm. And he may have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Mm. So, well, I wonder where that Hall of Fame is, the Gerard. The Dressage. Yeah. The, the article didn't say. It's, I'm just um, curious. It's the United not... States Dressage Federation Hall of Fame. Huh. And outside of that, he has been their coach and advisor okay. for years. And looking. Yeah, I don't know if we'll... we, we may. By the time you give us our, and on that. Well, we have a few more seconds. Let's give her a couple more seconds. Do you have anything else to report? Well, uh, GLAD in Boston has hired a new executive director, Ricardo Martinez. And prior to coming to GLAD in Boston and taking on New England and U.S. lawsuits, he was the CEO of Texas Equality going after Abbott, the Texas legislature. Good. And it was his track record there that, that brought it in. Yeah. convinced them that he was the person for the job. All right, Ian. I think we're out of time. Well, you know, there are a whole lot of them. They're regional halls of fame. Oh, ah, okay. Dressage regional halls of fame. Well, there oh, you go. Wait, then we definitely need to. Yeah. We continued. To continue. So remember, everybody, to resist. resist.